We sounded pretty good, didn't we, John? Well, the church is beautifully decorated, thanks to those who planned it and did it on Friday for their work. With this, we know it truly is Advent. Advent has begun. In addition, the first Advent candle has been lit. It, to me, it brightens the whole room. Even our music tells us, come, ye faithful people, be joyful and triumphant. The music warms our hearts. But Advent is more than pre-Christmas, more than preparing us for the nativity scene. The beginning of the liturgical year, every year, starts with a text that talks about the second coming and being prepared for the second coming of Christ. This does something very different than just setting the stage for the nativity scene. The church begins the new year celebration by focusing on the end. That's the end with a capital E, the expectation of Jesus' second and final coming. The reading today starts with an eschatological or end times discussion between Jesus and his disciples. The setting is that they have just left the temple in Jerusalem the disciples express awe and wonder at the magnificent temple. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, predicts its destruction. Later, he is asked by the startled disciples about when and how the prediction will be fulfilled. And as re recorded in Matthew 24, 36 through 44, Jesus tells them, but about the day and the hour, no one knows, neither angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken, and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let would not have let the house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Stanley Saunders points out that this reading is plucked right out of the middle of Jesus' final sermon in the Gospel of Matthew. It is a wild sermon that describes chaos, seductions, betrayals, and violence that will threaten the unity and the witness of the community of disciples. Threatens this small group which will be awaiting the second coming of Jesus. When the disciples point out the beautiful temple, Jesus predicts its total destruction before his return. The stunned disciples then ask very practical questions. When? When will this happen? What? What will be the signs we should look for for his coming in the end of the age? Sometime later, Jesus finally offers a direct answer to the when part of the question. He tells them, no one knows but God alone. Not exactly the answer they were looking for. Jesus rejects the notion that anyone other than God, including Jesus himself, knows the answer to the timing of his second coming, his return. While he still has their attention and our attention, he goes on to stress the importance of wakefulness or watchfulness and readiness in the in-between time. Here lies the theme for the rest of the passage as well as the four parables that mark the completion of Jesus' formal teaching in Matthew, 
the importance of wakefulness and readiness. Jesus essentially tells the disciples the importance of wakefulness and readiness by saying, let's review a little history of one of God's previous actions. Remember back to the story of Noah and the flood? In the days of Noah, the people went about their life as usual, right up to the moment when the floods came. Their activities of eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage are normal. That's what people do. It's important to note that here in this text, there's no moral judgment passed upon the people, no assumption here of their proverbial wickedness. They are doing what normal people do. Rather than judgment, the story has a different focus. It is used to illustrate the sudden and unexpected act of God. The people of Noah's day were not prepared for the flood. Yet the flood came. Ready or not, the flood swept them away. In the same way, Jesus implies his second coming will take place as a divine action. And most people will be taken by surprise. No one knows when, but God. But Jesus does not stop there. He goes on with another thought about who is impacted and when the coming occurs. Tells us about two instances. One is taken and one is left behind. Men in the field, women grinding grain, people doing normal things. These verses have often been misused, particularly in the last century or so, to support rapture theology, a theology that attempts to predict the when, and more importantly, for whom the rapture will occur. The rapture meaning end times when some will be transported to heaven and presumably others left behind. This prediction of time is precisely what Jesus is telling his disciples not to do. The parallel illustrations of the two in the field and the two grinding grain do not depict a moment when the righteous are plucked up from the earth and taken to heaven, while others are left behind to wait tribulation and final judgment. There is no indication of differences in standing of these two persons. Furthermore, if you were a first century listener, familiar or knowing the ways of the Roman Empire, being left behind was surely preferable to be taken into slavery by the Romans. Just like the people of Noah's day, when they were being swept away, was not an individualized moral judgment. Instead, these illustrations simply depict sudden, surprising separation without indicating cause of judgment or reward on, on the part of those taken or left behind. Some people may get caught up in the comfort of rapture theology. I recognize that. They may well be, comfort, be comforted by seeking the certainty or presuming they to have a secure inside track to heaven. But there is little or no scriptural support for that idea. The focus of Jesus' message in this text is remaining vigilant amidst the uncertainty of the long wait. In the midst of perhaps discouraging or even circumstances, we are to wait. Hopefully with this background about not knowing the time and not knowing the circumstances, the last admonition, keep awake and be ready, will make more sense. This is not easy advice. If this was advice for a crisis moment at a known time, it would be much easier, like knowing when the thief was to arrive. But this is not the advice for a crisis moment. This is a call to perpetual and persistent readiness, regardless of circumstances. As Christians, we live in the time between the time of the first coming and the resurrection, with the defeat of death has already occurred. We know this by faith. Yet we live on the edge waiting for the second coming. We are in the ready, already 
but not yet time. We live in between the already of salvation we have experienced in Christ and the not yet of the salvation being consummated in the world. As we await the full consummation of the second coming, for us, watchfulness and wakefulness are not a defensive preventive posture, but a state of heightened positive attentiveness. Attentiveness here means being attuned both to the signs of God's presence and God's power, as well as being realistic and aware of the signs of the powers of the world that are doubling down and distracting us. Consider the people from these stories and how they may be just like us. Consider the people of Noah's time, or the men in the field, or the women grinding, or even the homeowner. They, like us, likely would have made different choices if they had known what was to happen. If the homeowner had been attentive, the thief in the night could be dealt with. But one thing they all had in common was none of them knew. So too, we as Christians do not know, cannot know, and are not supposed to know when the Lord is coming. This is a condition we must embrace. We are not to attempt to overcome it by superior knowledge or imaginative predictions. Our tool is watching and readiness. Not watching and not readiness as if we're going to, at the last minute, turn something on or off according to some perceived need when the time comes. Not watchfulness or readiness as if we can control what is to happen, but perpetual watching and readiness for the coming. In Matthew's vision, watching and readiness are not to be a static state. The vision is for the church to be at work in the not yet places of the world, places where justice and equality have not yet been found, places where hunger and thirst have not yet been alleviated, places where children and adults die in senseless violence, places where the planet is not yet being treated with respect. Matthew's vision of the church waiting expectantly is one of the church making a difference in these not yet places. These are in fact the actions to which Jesus calls his disciples more than any other as the end of his ministry draws near. Jesus says you are living at the potential end, so stay awake and be a state of ready, active readiness. For about the day and the hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Therefore, you, must, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Amen.